Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Monica Barrett. She's a uh, Vice Chancellor Senior Research Fellow in Social and Global Studies Centre at RMIT University in Melbourne. She's currently undertaking a four-year program of research investigating psychoactive drug use in digital society, with topics of interest including digital drug trading, digitally enabled communities, legislative responses to new or novel substances, translation of police data into public health alerts, drug checking and festival harm reduction, drug checking in the community and microdosing. Monica has published over 70 academic research papers and attracted over $4 million in competitive funding in her almost 20 year career. She's also been a great friend of EGA for many years now and I remember certainly well over 10 years ago Monica was presenting to us uh, her PhD research at that time. Uh, Monica is the Australian lead for the Global Drug Survey and serves as an editor for leading journals in the drugs field, including the International Journal of Drug Policy and Drug and Alcohol Review. Monica also volunteers at bluelight.org, a global drug harm reduction community recently celebrating 20 years in action, and for the Loop Australia, a not-for-profit organisation that was started in 2018 uh, with the goal of conducting drug checking interventions both at festivals and in the community. Uh, Monica has attended and contributed to EGA since the mid-2000s and she continues to advocate for the recognition of the benefits and pleasures of psychoactive substance use in context with known risks, many of which arise from prohibitionist regimes themselves. So it's a great pleasure to, to welcome Monica and uh, her, her uh, talk will be entitled Encrypted Communications, Digitally Mediated Drug Trading and Psychedelics. Monica. Thanks a lot. Great to see you. Thanks for coming. So today I'm going to speak about encrypted communications, digitally mediated drug trading and relate that a bit to psychedelics as is the theme for Garden States today. Um, and first I'd like to acknowledge our country as I spend most of my time, not right now, most of my time are living and working on the Jar Jar Rurung people's land and they are the traditional custodians of this land. And I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. And I've just got a picture here of uh, a recent uh, local tree called the Grandmother Tree that was actually uh, crowdfunded and saved uh, recently in our area, which is excellent news. And I think Martin already mentioned this, but it's been now 10 years since the uh, Entheogenesis Australis 2011 edition, and I had such an excellent time there 10 years ago, some great memories. But it was also the first time that I presented on the topic of darknet markets, as only a few months earlier I'd become aware of, of the Silk Road darknet marketplace. So um, it's excellent to be back 10 years later to talk about this very same topic. Next slide. So yeah, the first thing I'll go through is I guess the evolving global drug markets uh, in terms of uh, thinking about where uh, darknet markets and digitally enabled markets fit within the broader drug markets uh, and also the features of these different markets, so open, closed and crypto markets. Next slide. So I really love this quote uh, and I think it goes to, often when we think about darknet, we think about it in uh, comparison to street drug markets. And this quote I think is quite good because it, in reality much of what is commonly called street drug markets, street level drug dealing in Australia is probably more accurately described as lounge room level dealing. And this is because it's far more likely to take place in the home of one of the parties to the transaction and involve people who know each other well. So this is essentially social supply, friends, uh, supplying friends, uh, usually during the act of actually using drugs themselves. So uh, it's important to think about that, um, but also that when we're thinking about digitally enabled drug markets, we have to go back a little bit because first we saw phones introduced, then pages, then mobile phones, and all of this changed how uh, drugs were traded uh, around Australia and the world. And so what we're looking at here today is how encrypted trading platforms and encrypted digital messaging have, uh, I guess, contributed to the innovation of drug trading at this time. Next slide. So in terms of drug crypto markets, first, just what are they? Probably most of you know what they are, but in case you don't, um, we've defined them as digital platforms that use anonymizing software. This is usually Tor and cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Monero, etc., to facilitate the trade of goods and services. 
And that typically is drugs, but there are a number of other services and goods that are sold. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's now been a decade since Silk Road began uh, earlier in 2011. So a feature of darknet markets, which you don't normally get in other kinds of marketplaces, is that you can collate vendor ratings. And these are utilised by buyers to discern best quality and service. Uh, they look through the comments as well as the, the ratings. Now, typically the drugs are then delivered through the postal system, but there's also some crypto markets where they use a dead drop system. So for example, the Hydra market in Russia, once you purchase the drugs, you just get a geolocation and you go to that spot and you can get them. Now that means there's less waiting involved. So that's an interesting innovation. So these are essentially decentralized and globalized drug exchanges. Next slide. And this is an example of Silk Road. Um, when I first saw it, uh, over 10 years ago now, and you can see there there's only really a few hundred drugs available at that time. And if we go to the next slide, we'll see uh, a screenshot of uh, a marketplace called Torres, which was actually something I screenshotted yesterday, um, two days ago in fact. And you can see there there's actually uh, over 37,000 uh, drug listings in Torres. Next slide. So I did some research uh, back in 2013, and this looked at who were the people using the Silk Road, which at the time was the only crypto market available, uh, as opposed to other kinds of drug buying. And it was essentially at that time young males of higher than average education and employment and almost all of them reported having used illegal drugs before. So this was not sort of, I guess, naive people that were coming in. And the most popular drugs bought, according to this research, was MDMA, cannabis, cocaine and LSD. And interestingly, we asked why people were using Silk Road. Uh, and convenience was the biggest factor. People, I, I would say, are getting so used to buying everything online. Why wouldn't they also do so with their drugs? Um, for many people, the quality was really important. They were able to get better strength, um, less adulteration, and also access to drugs they couldn't otherwise get to, so the range was better. Being able to look at the ratings for the vendors was important, and for some countries, not all, but countries like Australia, uh, price was a major factor. But that's not the same across the world. We just have very expensive drugs. <laughs> so in terms of using crypto markets, there's quite a bit to learn. Um, they have similar features to Amazon and eBay. But you have to learn these three things. You have to learn how to use Tor or other similar anonymous, um, anonymous browsers. You have to learn how to use um, PGP or encrypted messages. And then you need to learn how to use cryptocurrencies. And I think for a certain proportion of the population, this is standard, they already know about these things, this is fine, but that's a small proportion. And I think a lot of people, what we've found in some of the work we've done later, a lot of people are really put off by these things. It's just a bit too hard for them. Next slide. So in this um, table, which I'll get back to as we work through, I've looked at open markets, closed markets and crypto markets on a number of different features. So open markets would be a street market or the festival dealer or someone that you don't know at all who you can get, um, get drugs from. Closed market would be friend to friend or a known dealer, that sort of thing. And we've got crypto markets there. So you see there are some similarities between the open and crypto markets. You don't need to know someone. The introductions are not required for new entrants. But as you see there, the difficulty of entering relies on technical expertise for crypto markets. So that's a bit of a barrier for some people. It's a bit different because it relies on delivery mainly. And when you look down the bottom, those last two, the crypto market really shines because you have access to historical information to establish trust and you have a third party system designed for dispute resolution. So this is the escrow system. So the administrator of the marketplace will hold funds in escrow and those will only be released when the buyer says that the goods have been received. There are some issues with this system, but it's certainly a system that isn't there for standard face-to-face uh, -face markets. Next slide. So this graph uses the global drug survey data from the last few years, from 2004 to the most recent year this year. And you'll see in that, that graph in the middle that that's the global trend that we found. So um, what we're measuring here is 
Among people who use illegal drugs in the last 12 months, how many of them have purchased them or obtained them through the dark net? And we see that sort of slowly going up year on year. I've highlighted the Australian uh, figure there because we do seem to punch above our weight if, um, when you look through other countries, although uh, Russia, Finland, Sweden, Poland and the UK are definitely, uh, it's more prevalent there uh, according to the, to the data that we're using. And that data we've actually been giving to the UNODC and the World Drug Report because no one else is really asking about this stuff on a global scale. Next slide. So this is some Australian data from the Illicit Drug Data Report. This is what our, um, our police and customs put out every year. And it shows you around the last 10 years, looking at the number of international mail detections uh, where drugs are detected. And you see that that number, the percentage of detections through international mail just keeps on going up for all drugs. Um, it was um, you know, quite high originally for, for, cannabis, for MDMA to start with, but even other drugs it's going up. So we could interpret that as an increased use in, of this kind of supply. Uh, next slide. Okay, so I'm going to talk a bit about the evolution of crypto markets uh, and also give you a bit of a run through of one of the active markets that I had a look at a couple of days ago. Next slide. So as we saw, this is what it looked like 10 years ago. Uh, and you'll, you'll note right at the bottom there, one Bitcoin was worth $15.64. It's a bit different today. Next slide. So there was really just this one dominant marketplace in those years, 11 to 13. It was quite an unusual period of time because there was this sense of confidence. If, if this market could continue to, to grow like it did, how is it going to end? Uh, interestingly, uh, Dread Pirate Roberts, who is now serving time uh, in prison after the market was seized, he had a libertarian philosophy and he also had bans on a number of different things that he had decided were, were too harmful uh, to continue with on the site. Uh, and then on the 1st of October 2013, next slide, uh, next and then click again, uh, the site was seized by the FBI, click again. And a whole bunch of other sites came up uh, over the next couple of months. We had about 20. Uh, so there was one and no one was really a competitor until suddenly there were this many. Click again. These were some examples. Click, click, click. <laughs> yeah, of what happened, including, um, yeah, so Grams, which we just saw there, was actually uh, a new search engine that opened up at the time. So with this um, next period of time, you'd say, was the, the Renaissance. And we saw um, a number of different marketplaces open, as I just mentioned, but most of them had a really um, low, uh, they didn't last for too long. So it might have been six months, 12 months, that sort of thing. They didn't last forever. But we also saw all the Reddits open. And that was really important because people were being funneled through who didn't really know much about Tor or encryption into the marketplaces through these um, Darknet market Reddits. And we saw the cross-market search engine Grams. So really at the time, we concluded that the FBI's closure and the, and the arrests seem quite responsible for spurring on these innovations. I don't think they would have happened without that, um, particularly in connection to security. Next slide. Once again, however, the impact of this operation was short-lived. We had another seizure called Onimus. They love the names. <laughs> and the crypto market sales doubled from their pre-Onimus levels after only two months. Next slide. So then this next period of time, a whole bunch of other stuff happened, a bunch of innovations. We saw single vendor shops pop up. So some of the vendors were getting so confident and I guess had a lot of their own um, ratings and credibility that they would open up their own shop so they didn't have to pay administration fees to anybody else. And we also saw non-English language markets start to flourish in French, Russian, Finnish, etc. We saw that there were both law enforcement takedowns and there were exit scams from both administrators and vendors. And this all led to the development of multi-signature escrow. So this meant that out of the three parties involved in the transaction, the administrator, the buyer and the vendor, 
uh, you had to have at least two of those to get the money out. And that meant that the administrator couldn't just run off with the money as they had done before. Then there was a new law enforcement strategy, a kind of quiet takeover in 2017 of Alpha Bay and Hunza where the Dutch police, I believe, operated Hunza for about a month before they revealed that they had actually um, uh, arrested the owners. So, so that was a little bit different. And during this period of time, a number of different services were shut down. Reddit had banned their Darknet market Reddit, so that was a, a big deal. But again, innovation occurred, and in 2019 we saw the launch of Dread, which was a darknet version of Reddit, which has become really important in this, in this area, and a new cross-market search called Kilos, which was like grams, but better. Uh, and I guess, yeah, the last couple of years we've seen, obviously we've seen the pandemic, and, and that's had a ver varied effects on drug markets. I don't know if it's, it's almost too, too soon to say exactly how it's affected the crypto markets, but they're definitely still there. And the rise and fall of a new sort of combination of crypto market and app called Televen, which I'll talk through. Yet, as illustrated through the sales volume and the survey data, the darknet markets are still a viable and utilised drug trading platform. Next slide. So this is just an example of what Dread looks like. It's essentially uh, like Reddit, but on the darknet. And what this really has meant is that when uh, darknet markets die or are taken over or whatever, their forums and their communities don't die with them. Everything is much more, um, I guess, able to be saved in this archive of dread. Next slide. And this is Kilos. So essentially it's like, it's sort of modelled on Google and the idea is that regardless of what market is up or down, you should be able to search for what you want and find something. Next slide. So this is really just a few screenshots that I've done of Torres to give you an idea of a current market and what's going on there. And I won't obviously go through everything in detail, but they talk here about multi-sig escrow, which we spoke about earlier. Next slide. Uh, there's also, um, yeah, I mean, there's a, a really interesting FAQ here about the dispute system, what to do, um, expected timeline for every action on the site. Next slide. Uh, and then the vendor ranking, which they have. So depending on the number of items you've sold, you can then see this ranking, as well as the, the sort of um, five star or, or less ratings that you see for each individual item sold. Next slide. So there's also a few things they prohibit. So similar to Silk Road, um, this particular marketplace will not allow child pornography. It will not allow fentanyl. Uh, so it, it accepts that there are some drugs that perhaps should not be sold on these sites. Next slide. So, and then when you actually get through all of that, uh, you actually get to see what the market looks like. Uh, and I think I showed this slide earlier. Next slide. Uh, so I've gone and had a look at what is underneath the drugs and chemicals 
uh, title there. So you can see the different kinds of drugs that are available. Next slide. And these are the kinds of psychedelics that are available um, from LSD through to some um, less prevalent ones there at the bottom. Next slide. And I had a little look at the 5-MeO-DMT to see what was going on there. Um, I think we only had 25 items available, so it does start to get a little bit, you know, when you start to get to some of the psychedelics that aren't very well used, um, there's maybe not so many options. But most of these options were um, from whatever country they were into the world, uh, and they were easy to ship. Uh, next slide. So this was just one example of what you get. With most of these listings, there will be very verbose descriptions. This one begins with 5-MeO-DMT is a testament to the interconnectedness of our living world, while being at the same time allowing the human mind to process exactly how interconnected everything is. So, so it, it won't just typically be, we've got this drug, we want to sell it to you. There'll be a, a lot of stuff going on there. Um, next slide. And also harm reduction dosage. So in this, in this one, you'll see here, it says effects will be apparent with a dose as low as one milligram. And then it goes on to talk about the light, um, the standard and the buckle up and have a friend nearby dose uh, as they discuss. Next slide. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit briefly about what's also been going on in this last 10 years, which is the use of, of social media apps and messaging apps. Uh, and some people are using those instead of crypto markets. So I'll briefly skip through that. Next slide. So some of these apps you can see here, uh, Snapchat, Wicca, Telegram, etc., are being used in various ways to assist with drug trading. Next slide. So, and you may have seen some of the press in the last couple of years. This was a Herald Sun article last year. Victorian drug dealers are brazenly using Instagram to ply their trade. Next slide. So how it typically works uh, is a little bit different to the crypto markets. There'll be a public feeds with hashtags, and this will be the initial connection with the buyer. They're searching for a hashtag and they see this public post. So this is a, an Instagram post example. And then in the comments, there'll be a more secure messaging app that will be mentioned. So in this one, they mentioned WhatsApp and Wicca. And then this will lead to a local meetup. So everything sort of proceeds as it would through in-person markets. Next page. So recently, there's been a few articles published uh, looking at some of this data. For example, this one on Telegram, all the public groups where drugs are discussed on Telegram. Next slide. So putting apps into this uh, features of drug markets table, you see there's actually quite a lot of similarities between apps and open markets. Uh, you don't, and that last two lines are important, you don't get that information, that historical information to establish trust and you don't have any third party resolution systems. Next slide. So um, I was involved in a project uh, a couple of years ago where we asked people about apps and why, were they, why they were using them. And I thought this quote really summed it up. It just seemed like a simple modern way to buy things. I'd gotten really sick of the dark net because I never really got it. So I always had to have a friend around on hand to help me out. With apps, it's super simple. I get it, and in no time I've managed to connect with strangers who I would never have been able to access before. So for this person, apps were allowing them to do, I guess, what a street market connect would allow them to do. Next slide. And some of the other things people spoke about which were a little concerning uh, was visual dealing practices. So this person was saying through Snapchat, they could actually see their dealer opening sealed packages on their story and they felt safer consuming it because of that, which kind of bothers me because I'm sure they could, they could be faking that kind of thing. And even this last quote where they say, well, it's much more secure. You know, law enforcement can't access it. Well, you know, um, I don't know sure if that's actually quite true, but certainly there's a lot of, of this kind of sentiment out there, especially among some of the young people we interviewed for this study. Next slide. So what we've also seen is a combination of apps and crypto markets. So it, this idea of multi-channel marketing, which is a concept from legal commerce, the idea that you interact with customers using a combination of indirect and direct communication channels. So for example, the crypto market vendors will offer Wicca messaging as an alternative trading platform, and that will increase convenience, especially when they've established a relationship. And they also offer discounts for that because it means they don't need to get the commission from the crypto market. Next slide. So that leads to the last part of our talk, which is about Televend. And this is a combined darknet app. 
darknet market slash app. Um, we'll just walk through it a little bit and speak really briefly about the data that we've collected about it and then sum up. So next slide. So this is a screenshot I took a few months ago on my phone of the Televen market. Um, and yeah, so I've been doing this research for the past 12 months and as is often the case with this research work, you do the research and then suddenly you, what you're researching disappears and this is kind of what happened. So in October 2020, it rose up as Televend and then in September, it has, a, has had a suspected exit scam. So Televend is actually no longer accessible. It's still interesting to look at it though and I think because it could end up being a template for future, I guess, configurations of digital trading. So it described itself as a direct deal platform uh, which uses Telegram bots so shop bots to interface with customers via a shop front, shop front inside the app and on the other side, a tour based onion vendor panel for the vendors to manage their orders and customers. So it had these sort of two aspects. And if you're not, not familiar with Telegram, it's a very popular messaging app, which does offer end to end encryption, but only if you ask for it. So it's not always encrypted. Next slide. Uh, that's it. So it appeared to combine features of the darknet market format at the back end while also using a messaging app at the front end. And it had some escrow options, but that wasn't the norm. So it was normally direct deal, so just a normal buy sell. And the shop bots were completely different. They were available through Telegram uh, and you essentially interacted with this robot in order to buy. And so I guess our question when we, we encountered this was, you know, could this, the above set of innovations make the Televen model, as they stated on their front page, the new generation in dark web marketplace? Next slide. So this is just a bit of a run through um, what it looked like a few months ago when it was up. This was the back end. It looked very much like a typical uh, darknet market. Next slide. It had a fee structure. It was very open about that um, for its vendors, commission collected in advance. Next slide. And you could, as I did here, search for anything. So I searched for MDMA that shipped from Australia to Australia, and I got a few entries for that. Next slide. Uh, and in this particular case, I, um, I found a vendor called Oz Express, and I was able to look through all of their um, vendor listings. Next slide. And also some really good feedback. So feedback that even had an order value on it. So it was quite detailed. Next slide. But this is where things changed. As soon as I wanted to buy from this guy, I had this message come up, basically go to Telegram now. Next slide. So I did that um, and interacted with the bot. So what you did was you said, show us your catalog. Uh, yes, I'd like to know more about MDMA. Yes, I'd like to know more about this particular thing. And you can see there the, the things you could check on. So basically, I got as far as putting it into my cart. Next slide. So what you could do is you could actually see lists of all of these uh, vendors who had verified shop bots. Uh, if you, and this, was, this again, you didn't need to have an encrypted browser to see any of this stuff. Next slide. So what we did was we actually added a, a, an item into the Global Drug Survey last year uh, saying, if you've bought from Televen, we'd love to know. Uh, so essentially, we got a really small number, 114, who said they'd bought from Televen. Next slide. And this was, sorry, with this, with this question here, which is where did you purchase whatever drug type from in the last 12 months? Next slide. And what we found was that it was cannabis mainly purchased, but then cocaine, MDMA and LSD were uh, purchased as well. Next slide. And so um, to put this in context, getting all of that data and having a look at all the different possible sources, and I wanted to point this out because it's really, it's important that pretty much 90% of people said in person was the source that they'd used in the last 12 months. Um, but we see there, if you look at darknet markets, that for cannabis, it was about 7% in the last 12 months. But for other drugs, it was about 15%. And it was 21% for LSD. So this meant that of our global sample, about one in five people who had used LSD in the last 12 months had bought it from the darknet markets. So it's clearly uh, an important factor here. Next slide. So what I then did was looked at the Televen group, which was small, and compared them to darknet market and the social messaging or app uh, um, purchasing. And what we saw there was that the, um, 
the age, uh, the Televend people were essentially demographically similar to the darknet market people and not so much the social media people. And the importance there was thinking about, well, does Televend appeal to app, I guess, app buyers or does it appeal to darknet buyers? And at least in this nascent stage, it really only appealed to darknet buyers according to this, this data set. Next slide. So I've thrown that fifth column in there, um, this sort of crypto app combination, where does it sit? And I think what's interesting here is that again, like crypto, crypto and app, you don't require an introduction to enter. So there's, but there's also a low level of technical expertise required. You only have to download an app. It's a really big difference. But at the bottom, you see that if it was working properly, you also get some of the best parts of crypto markets. You get to access the historical information and you get the third party resolution system. So in a way, I look at that fifth column and say that's probably the safest and the best combination. Now, it obviously hasn't worked. These people have retired uh, Televen, but we might see something pop up like this in the future. Next slide. So yeah, implications, questions. So darknet markets clearly continue to evolve and innovate. <laughs> I put here, perhaps law enforcement should give up. And I mean, I say that because it's quite unclear what the purpose of the law enforcement busts are. When you track what actually happens after those busts, they don't appear to be achieving what I believe they think they're achieving. So the question is, what is the point there? Um, and, and as I mentioned before, we don't know whether this Televend hybrid combination model will become uh, the next generation of dark web marketplace. That's something to look at in, in the next few months. I don't know if we're going to see competitors use this same combination. And one reason why they might is because it might just be more appealing to more people. There seems to be a bit of a ceiling on the number of people that are prepared to learn about cryptography and to really understand how to use the dark net. We know that a lot of people are scrolling through their social media feeds all the time. So this is something they do already. So it's not that hard for them to go that step further. Next slide. So I'm closing up here. I did want to mention that the Global Drug Survey 2022 is now happening. You can go to globaldrugsurvey.com. And the reason I mention it is we do have questions in there all about this as we do every year. Um, and it's always exciting to see how this changes year on year. So if you're willing to have a look, we'd really love to check that out. Next slide. And especially because uh, one of our excellent people here, Liam Engel, uh, is involved in the mescaline containing cactus module, which is the first time we've measured mescaline containing cactus use in Global Drug Survey. So we're super excited about that. Next slide. So I've come to the end of this presentation. Super happy to take any questions and thanks for having me. Yeah, in terms of novel, novel psychoactive substance responses by governments, what's essentially been happening is this cat and mouse game. So we get the government saying we're going to go in harder and prohibit more and make our prohibitions broader and broader and broader so that we can try and kind of catch these people that are trying to take these, I guess, these little pathways to sell something that's you know, not being covered by the law. And so the most broad version of that was something we saw um, a few years ago now in Australia, and we've also seen it in the UK uh, and a few other countries, where essentially anything that is psychoactive, regardless of its harm potential or anything that we know about the harms, unless it's on a list of exclusions, which include alcohol, tobacco, and a number of other things, is prohibited. So there's, they've tried to make it as broad as possible and it's, it's quite concerning in terms of what that means for being able to take a psychoactive substance. I think, you know, I mean, I'll quote Steve Bright here, you know, it's mm -hmm. okay to be psychoactive. You know, there is nothing inherently wrong with a substance that is psychoactive. And what the prohibition regime has done here is equate harm with psychoactivity which is problematic. It's quite possible that there are some of these novel substances that are actually psychoactive, but not as harmful as some of the other substances that are much more commonly used. And if that were the case, you know, we wouldn't want to be necessarily banning that substance. We might want to be regulating that substance. So it is a concerning development. 
And I mean, you know, what we see on these dark net marketplaces is complete access to all of these substances. Uh, you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of substances can be found. But what's also interesting there, as I showed in the slides, is that when you get down to some of those rare substances, there's only a few listings. And partly that's because there's a very healthy desire by people who use substances to consume the well-known substances. There's a strong you know, pull, pull there. And so what we tend to find when people are using novel substances, uh, they might be psychonauts, they might really just want to use this new substance and really like it, but oftentimes they're kind of being forced into it. So we see, um, for example, 10 years ago in the West Australian mine sites, they were testing very heavily for cannabis. And so when some of these synthetic cannabis varieties were sold in the mines, that was why they used them. They would have used cannabis. They couldn't because they were getting workplace tested. So we see this time and time again when you start to push this down uh, on the traditional illegal drugs. We then see people pop up and say, well, what, what else can we use? What else can we find that gets through? So I think it's not that different to the thing we see with the cat and mouse game between law enforcement and crypto market administrators. What we see there is this similar sort of tussle between uh, people who would like to consume a psychoactive substance and people who would like to shut that down. And in the end, the demand and the supply remains. You know, what we've seen is that the, the main, um, and it depends on how you measure it. <laughs> so if you're measuring which of the drug classes sold on the dark net through scraping dark net market websites, and if you look at the number of listings, then cannabis definitely wins. It's, it's the one. Any cannabis type product, so it's not just standard, but all kinds of edibles and concentrates and all that sort of thing, that's where you get the most of it. And then MDMA tends, tends to come second. So, um, you know, cocaine is there, amphetamines are there for sure. And then I think that's where you come to the psychedelics as, as a class. So, you know, when we measure it a different way, where we actually ask people, you know, what, um, you know, if you've used this substance in the last 12 months, did you buy it from the dark net? That's when we see LSD is very high. And I think that's something in particular about LSD being, you know, accessible and it's so potent, available in, you know, impregnated onto paper, it's much easier to send that in an envelope and it's probably just an easier drug to get around. Uh, so I think some of the drugs that are more potent are going to be more accessible. In terms of whether or not they're being sold through, through the social media accounts, it's much harder to get data on that. We don't, we can't just scrape all the social media accounts. And, you know, we, there have been some attempts to do that kind of thing, and I don't think psychedelics have been a huge part of that. Um, I've definitely seen accounts, and maybe some that Nick has shown, where they're focusing on psychedelics, so that's definitely a thing uh, as well. Um, but yeah, what we saw in the survey when we asked about where you got your drugs in the last 12 months, the apps tend to come up for cannabis. That tends to be the uh, and when we have, have a look at some countries around the world, like in Israel and I think in Mexico and Brazil, there are some really well-established kind of app-based markets for cannabis, cannabis only. So that might explain some of that as well. That's a fantastic question I do not know the answer to. I guess the fact that when we ask it the other way around, when we ask you know, through a survey or through interviews, you know, we do get people that say that they buy drugs and do indeed receive drugs through you know, Facebook Messenger, Instagram, etc. but also through Discord, a whole bunch of other you know, apps that may not initially be associated with, with drugs. Given that 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 exists, we can say, well, people are doing it and it's not just law enforcement, but absolutely. I mean, it's so, it's so problematic, you know, these public, they're, they're public accounts uh, and it really could be a trap most of the time. <laughs> so there's, yeah, you know, we don't have any ratings, we don't have any sense of has this person been, you know, doing this for a long time and is trustworthy, we get none of those cues through these public posts. So it's buyer beware, I think. Yeah, that's an excellent question that I've been working on for quite some time. And 
it's really hard to compare. Uh, you know, and again, it's about how you measure it. So when you ask people for their perceptions, people who buy from darknet markets and from elsewhere, they'll often say that one of the reasons they buy from darknet markets is because of increased purity, decreased adulteration. And theoretically, that makes sense. Theoretically, you know, if you're a vendor that has a reputation to uphold in those marketplaces, and if buyers only buy from such vendors, then it makes sense that you have... I guess this feedback loop that if you do the wrong thing deliberately or even if you make a mistake, that you're going to be punished for that. You know, there's going to be rating loss, there's going to be comments. And so it makes sense that that would be the case. However, is it actually the case? And so one of the studies that we haven't published yet, but well, we're getting there, was looking at um, some uh, data from the Australian Federal Police, uh, which um, we, we negotiated access to. Uh, which looked at some of the um, controlled sales that they had done through darknet markets about five years ago. Uh, and so what was great about that information was it gave us uh, basically what it was sold as, but also then what they tested it to be, uh, and then also what its purity was. It's not complete data because we don't really, we don't have a screenshot of the actual listing, so we don't know what the vendor actually said about the product. So when we looked at that, um, we also said that, well, what are we comparing it to? This is great, but how do we know that this is good or bad? How do we know that the street market or the friendship, social media, whatever, the other markets would provide us with similar or different? So then we had a chat with Victoria Police Forensics and we said, well, if we compare your data and say that that's a kind of quasi snapshot of what's actually going on out there, huge caveats, obviously it's seizures, so seizures could be different from the, bro the broader drug market. So yeah, what well, we had a look at that, we found that the methamphetamine was exactly the same on the darkness as it was out in Victoria. It was all 80%. It was all strong. It was all not adulterated. So that was no surprise. But when it came to things like cocaine, heroin, MDMA, um, it was mixed. Um, we had more, we had adulterations of MDMA that we found in the AFP data. Um, so that, you know, didn't really make sense, but it was there. It was NF or pentalone being sold as MDMA. Uh, and we had really varied purity of uh, heroin and cocaine that was, you know, questionable. But in the end, on the other side, uh, in the Victoria Police data, which was sort of representative of, of that whole market, um, the median purity for these drugs was higher on the darknet market samples than it was on, the, um, on the, the normal market. So it's a bit of a mixed picture. And I think it's, it's a really, what I really wanted to do was actually get the government to give us money to buy the drugs for the dark net <laughs> and, and then test the drugs. And um, it got, actually got past a few little hurdles and then it, yeah, eventually they just said, no, you can't do that. <laughs> so I think that's probably the only way to really test it. Um, and maybe one day we'll be able to do that work. Yes, yeah, so we have seen that over the years and that was the topic of my talk 10 years ago was about you know, Australia and its desire to filter our internet and what that meant for people who use drugs. Uh, and at the moment there's actually an inquiry, a public, a federal inquiry um, by a law enforcement based committee into this whole topic. Uh, I don't know what prompted the inquiry but they are collecting submissions right now. So. There's, I guess, a desire at that level, at that federal level, to regulate further. And so it is, yeah, I guess, so what are my fears and what are my hopes? I mean, it depends on what hat I've got on. And, you know, with the hat on of people who use drugs that should be able to do so safely, you know, for me, the darknet markets provide avenues for that. Um, it doesn't mean that it is safe, but it means that there are, you know, better protections, some protections at least. Um, there's more information there about those more recent purchases and those vendors. So, you know, I, what I expect, I guess, is that we will continue to have this cat and mouse game and this innovation. But what I would hope is that we have a complete paradigm shift. Um, you know, we need to really consider whether we need to be prohibiting all of these drugs. And, you know, we need to consider what the harms are of that prohibition. 
Uh, and I know that's a step too far for many people and it's sort of, you know, we have to, we step close, uh, sort of step shyly into that and say, well, let's look at decriminalisation first, let's look at decriminalising use and possession. That is definitely a good thing that we should be looking into. But it doesn't solve the problem of the supply itself. And when the supply is not safe, then, you know, more people die. And we know that. That's, I've, I've given evidence at coronial inquests a number of times in the last three years uh, and had to meet the parents of these people that have died in situations that were completely preventable. So I would argue that we can prevent those situations not by trying to assume that we're all not going to take psychoactive drugs because that's a complete impossibility and not even desirable, but instead, you know, what about making those drugs safer? So I think we still have to go there and I guess that's what I'll keep trying to um, aim for over the next coming years. Yeah, so Energy Controller, a Spanish drug checking service that has run their, their service for about 25 years now, but they've since 2014 run an international drug testing service. And that's been aimed at darknet markets. It's been aimed at people from anywhere in the world being able to send a sample in uh, and find out what's in it uh, as quickly as possible and how pure it is if it's one of the major drugs. They've had to be quite careful because one of the critiques that they've been getting locally in Spain by authorities there is that this service should not be used by dealers to advertise how good their products are. And of course, that's kind of what does happen a bit. Uh, and they do say, you know, that's not our intention and you definitely shouldn't be putting this on your profile and saying that you've come to us. That's not helping us and that's not helping the community. But in the end, again, it's, it's about the political pressures that drug checking organisations find themselves under. And, and the most, I guess the best thing I would hope for to resolve that would be what's just happened in New Zealand, which is the first country in the world to create special legislation to make drug checking completely legal for everybody involved. Uh, and that's, we actually, even though the Netherlands and Spain have been doing drug checking for what seems like eons, they don't have special legislation and they still have to dance around a bit when it comes to these sorts of things. So, you know, um, that's what we would need is, is legislation to make it okay for everyone involved in drug checking to do the job of hoping, you know, getting that information out there.